The Gospel reading today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, and it can be found on page 825 in your pew Bible. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On our second reading today, we look into the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, to Psalm 15, which uh, we'll see is filled with wisdom. This is a psalm of David. And in verse 1, David writes, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right, and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor heap shame upon their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment to pray before we reflect, shall we? Oh, gracious God, we thank you again for your presence here with us today. And we come before you in humility, knowing that you are so much greater than us, but yet you love us more than we can possibly fathom. We are of great value in your eyes, so we pray, O God, that you would teach us how to live faithfully for you. Help us to know how to grow closer to you and to enrich each other's lives as we meditate upon your word. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, Fred and Tim uh, were best friends since childhood, and they were having lunch together one day when uh, Tim said, Fred, I've decided I'm finally ready to get married. What do you think I should look for in a partner? Fred replied, You should look for someone who has a really embarrassing tattoo with no intention of changing it. Why, Tim replied, Fred said, because she knows how to make bad decisions and stick by them. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, love, it manifests itself in unique ways in some friendships, but uh, what does love look like at its best? What are the characteristics of love when it's expressed ideally? Well, that's the very issue that the author of Psalm 15 speaks to. Scholars believe that this psalm was originally written by an ancient Israelite priest who was contemplating what virtues a person needed to possess to worship God in the Jerusalem temple. And uh, this person's God-inspired reflection paints a beautiful portrait of what genuine love looks like love of God, but also love between people. It helps us understand how to genuinely love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus puts it in our gospel reading today that Carolyn read for us earlier. So in this beautiful poem, we really see love defined. The psalmist begins by emphasizing what's central to being a loving 
person. It's about giving the best of ourselves to others. And he teaches us this in a really interesting way of all things by referring to the sacrifice of animals in the ancient Israelite temple in Jerusalem. We read in verse 1 and 2 again, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly. It's that word blamelessly that alludes to animal sacrifice. Uh, Animals, they were sacrificed during worship in the Jerusalem temple until the temple was destroyed by the Romans about three decades after Christ's crucifixion. And uh, these sacrifices were called in Hebrew, carbonot was what these sacrifices were called. The animals sacrificed, they had to be domesticated, uh, not wild so that the person sacrificing them was actually making a sacrifice, giving up something that they owned to God. You know, priests like our psalmist today wanted people's animal sacrifices to be thoughtful and uh, also what scripture calls to meme, which literally meant complete, intact, or free of blemish. The priests, in other words, they they didn't want people dragging in roadkill they happened to stumble upon on their way to the temple that day to offer to God. Uh, They wanted people to bring the best of their herds and their flocks, gifts that were of value to worshipers. And that Hebrew word to mean, used to describe the best animal sacrifices, to mean is the same Hebrew word translated as blamelessly in our passage and applied to people when the psalmist says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? That's a reference to the temple in your tent. Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly those who walk to me. So what's most important about the way that we love God and others, according to the psalmist here, is that we offer our best. We shouldn't give those we genuinely love the equivalent of leftover chicken in the fridge we don't want to eat, you know. We, we shouldn't give God or loved ones the leftover aspects of who we are, if you will, but instead should offer them the best of who we are so that our presence in their lives will have the best possible impact. So the psalmist here is, is emphasizing that love isn't primarily about the temporary warm and fuzzy feelings that people in love have for each other is it's oftentimes characterized in our culture you know warm feelings are good they're wonderful but but love as the psalmist portrays it is primarily about substance about offering the best of what we've got over the long haul And uh, one of those best things we can offer, the psalmist goes on to explain, is honesty expressed in helpful ways. He continues in verse 2 and 4 describing those who do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors. The Hebrew words there translated as right and truth They refer to honesty. And and the word translated as evil, when the text says, and do no evil to their friends, that word referred to the, the misery, the suffering, or harm that people cause each other. So loving others is being honest in ways that benefit others. Which is an important distinction, isn't it? Because blunt honesty in every situation doesn't always benefit people. You know, we've talked about this before and we've all heard the familiar examples. You know, someone saying to somebody else, you know, hi Frank, boy do you look ugly today, you know, or, uh, or James, I really appreciate that you made me dinner, even though it tasted like dog poop, you know. Uh, That might be honest, but there's absolutely nothing helpful about that kind of honesty. And in fact, 
On a serious note, people's honest words and actions expressed faultlessly or inappropriately, they can be some of the most hurtful, degrading, and traumatic experiences that recipients of those comments can encounter in life. We can really tear people down with honesty if we're not careful. So the psalmist teaches us to be honest in ways that avoid causing others misery. He's very specific about that. And and how do we achieve that? Well, it's by being honest about things that really matter in ways that build people up. We can see that it's going to build people up. For instance, uh, sharing honest thoughts about someone's behavior when their actions are hurting others. They might not realize what they're doing is hurting others, but we can be honest with them and it helps everyone involved. Or giving honest advice to another who's living in an abusive situation. Uh, That's the kind of advice that can help remove someone from a situation where they're being harmed. Uh, Or being honest when, when people explicitly ask for our opinion about something. Uh, It's important to wait for those open doors to express honesty. When when we're honest with others about things that matter in ways that build people up, that demonstrates our commitment to give the best of ourselves to them, to offer to mean something, to mean, as the psalmist would say. But, But genuine love involves more than just being honest with others. It also involves being honest with ourselves about the ways that others' behavior is affecting us. In verse 4, the psalmist touches on this when he talks about someone in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord. Uh, The Hebrew word translated as wicked there describes someone who was essentially held at arm's length by others literally cast away because their actions were toxic. And uh, if someone is doing something that is hurting us, it's important for us to keep this in mind, to be honest with ourselves about the negative impact their behavior is having upon us, and to take steps to establish healthy boundaries that protect us from being mistreated. You know, Jesus may have said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, but uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep people's toxic behavior at arm's length while we're offering up gracious prayers for them. I've mentioned before that, that being a loving person doesn't mean being a doormat for anybody. Uh, that sends the wrong message to them about what a healthy relationship is, which doesn't help anybody grow and learn. Love is about being honest with others in ways that benefit them, but equally as important, it's also about being honest with ourselves about the effect other people's behavior is having upon us, whether it's benefiting us or not and and responding appropriately. That's another way that we can give our best to God and others. It's another way that we can express genuine love. But lastly, in verse 4 and 5, the psalmist writes about those who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do not lend money at interest. So if you work at a bank or a credit union, you're out of luck. You'll uh, never experience love, right? Uh, no, when, when the psalmist talks about not lending money at interest here, he's, he's referring to avoiding what we call today predatory lending, which was a terrible problem in many ancient societies. He's, he's giving examples in his day of ways to express love, by nurturing trust. Trust is the product of a history of good relationship dynamics between people. Uh, Keeping with the whole financial theme here, thinking of trust as a shared spiritual bank account, that's a helpful metaphor. Every time we relate to others in honest, healthy ways and expect the same treatment from them, 
we make a deposit into our combined trust account, which allows us to take risks uh, with others, to, to be vulnerable before others. You know, since there's been so much uh, trust capital that's been deposited in the relationship account in the past, we can be confident that if something does go wrong, if somebody does screw up in a way that violates trust, and we experience the loss of some of that trust, all the trust that's been built up can give us a better chance of resolving the problem to everyone's benefit. Keeping oaths and avoiding exploiting others financially, as the psalmist suggests, are good examples of specific ways to build trust that spoke specifically to what was going on in his society. But every time honesty and healthy boundaries characterize our relationships, trust is reinforced. So as I said, this psalm is filled with wisdom that we can apply to our everyday lives. Love defined, according to our psalmist, is giving our best to God and other people by being honest with them and ourselves in healthy ways so that we build trusting relationships that ultimately enrich everyone's lives. So our psalm challenges us to ask ourselves, do I have the courage to genuinely love God and other people in my life in these ways so that everyone, including me, can experience the great fruit of that love. Amen.